Welcome. I'm uh, very honored to be on the stage. I've been on uh, some DrupalCon stages uh, earlier. Perhaps uh, some people have seen me in Prague singing the opera uh, uh, at the pre-note. Uh, maybe some people have seen me unproposed to my boyfriend in Amsterdam last year. Uh, and actually, I'm more nervous right now <laughs> than uh, at uh, the last couple of times I was uh, on a DrupalCon stage. I'm a first-time speaker, so I'm very happy that I have an audience to uh, tell you something more about uh, large-scale agile Drupal development. Um, so this is uh, what was on the... This is the subject, how to herd a flock of product owners. And uh, I talked to some people already uh, uh, prior to, uh, to this talk about um, that it's also sort of like how to make an elephant dance the cha-cha. We started out, uh, I started out doing some projects for some small NGOs and some small companies who needed uh, something more than just a digital flyer, and it grew and it grew and it grew, and my customers became bigger and bigger and bigger. And sometimes you work for customers with, with uh, a million budget and uh, uh, 3,000 employees. And, um, well, it feels like making an elephant dance the cha-cha-cha sometimes. Um, so that's why I wanted to talk about uh, this uh, problems and, and uh, challenges that you face when you work with large clients. A little bit about myself. Uh, no nick needed um, to get uh, the frequently asked questions started already. Yes, I do like beer. Uh, you can't really read it, but on the t-shirt Ruben is wearing there, it says, calm down and get the beers in. Um, it really is my last name, and no, I will not marry you or anything, any, anybody else for that matter. Uh, there are 1,559 beerses in the Netherlands, so if you really want to marry one, just go there and find one. <laughs> Probably somewhere above the area of Amsterdam, you will find a lot of people called beers, actually. Uh, and I would love to get my hands on a t-shirt. Ruben, have you found it yet? You lost it in Prague, right? Yeah, I found it. You found it? Yeah. Okay, if someone get me, can get me one of these, I really uh, would appreciate it. Okay, I'll fix you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, who am I and why this presentation? I, I told you something already about this. Um, because I think a lot of Drupal shops around Europe and the world uh, cope with the same kind of challenges when meeting with larger companies. So, um, oh, a small commercial break. Uh, thank you to my employer, uh, Synetic. <laughs> <laughs> Which made sure I, uh, I could get on the stage here today. So, thank you. Renier is here. Thank you, Renier. <laughs> so, uh, this was made possible by them. Okay. Uh, a little bit more about myself than just my surname. Uh, I'm... 34, um, I've been active in open source for about 13 years now. I started out at a small company doing open source CRM, open source voice over, voice over IP using Asterix, uh, and also open source CMSs. Home broom, but you know, it takes a while before you get smarter than that. Um, I've been a Drupalista for about five years now. Um, you can find me on drupal.org, Nancy Beers. Um, and I've been a product owner for two years. Um, I started out uh, Waterfall, Prince 2, stuff like that, and then I saw the light and became Scrum Master and a Scrum product owner. Um, so I'm fairly new, actually, to, to the whole uh, product owner thing. Uh, I'm working at Synetic, and I'm loving uh, Skit since Drupalcon London. So that's about four years now, uh, and uh, next to that, my biggest passion, or even, yeah, I love... Skit and handball more than Drupal, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm a handball player and referee. And uh, the biggest fact about the refereeing is that I, uh, I, I refereed the uh, uh, Dutch championships last summer. So I'm pretty proud of that. Sorry? Sorry, are you a team handball player? Yep. <laughs> you, 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 can, uh, you can count. Great. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I'm not a programmer, but I do, um, uh, I'm a storyteller. So let me take you away to a little story called Scrumtopia. 
A long, long time ago, in a kingdom far, far away, there was a little town called Scrumtopia. There were a lot of villages there, like the customer village, the scrum master village, and the developer village. In the... Oh, I'm sorry. I wanted to scroll. In the customer village, there were customers with limitless budgets. The only thing they needed, needed to be happy was working software in short sprints so they could adjust what they wanted at any given time. They simply loved change and changes and change some more and think out of the box and stepping out of their comfort zone. The customers knew exactly what they wanted and their leader, the product owner, had the ultimate mandate and overview of all their wishes to communicate it with the developer village. She prioritized, knew all the processes, did it again, sorry. <laughs> um, she prioritized, knew all the processes within the village, handled politics very well, and was always available to the developers, which was great, since the developers were always working on one project at a time, all week. Once a project was finished, they simply started a new one, because the product and the sprint backlog was perfectly managed by the product owner. Every once in a while, two princes came down paddling the nearby waterfall to tell the developers <laughs> Sorry. To tell the developers to write extensive reports for the change advisory board witches or the great CFO wizard up the mountain. We need more paper, they demanded, it, or it's off with your heads. Luckily, the scrum masters from Scrum Master Town came to their aid and told the prince two princes to bugger off and stop wasting the developers' valuable time and resources. Every time you want an extra report, the waste pile grows and it grows bigger and the trees will die and we are less productive, the scrum master said. Please let us be working in peace and deliver products. The princess came to their senses, started the buff session on the village square and told everybody how they had come to understand that making reports can be just a way of window dressing instead of being completely transparent on what's going on in a project. In a nearby forest, there also lived two giants. One was called Fitzcope, who seems to be as mythical as unicorns or the monster of Loch Ness, by the way. Um, next to um, Fitzcope, there was another giant called Fixed Budget. They were friendly giants when you meet them. The developers lived in harmony with them, and when they, are uh, when they were encountering them, they just followed their rules and they'd be okay. For instance, when Fixed Scope came along, who doesn't really exist? When, when Fixed Scope came along, the developers started building using modules from the Drupal Tree of Wisdom so they could meet the requirements needed to keep the giant happy. Some other times, encountering Fixed Budget, they, they kept a keen eye on the business value they offered building their software so the giant would acquire the most of his, for his golden coins. On a dark, windy night, Fixed Scope and Fixed Budget met and went to the developers together. You can imagine what a horrible sight that must have been. The developers all got worn out by having to build more within the Fixed Budget's limits because somehow Fixed Scope wasn't so fixed at all. Now he knew that they would charge him not any more money anyways. The developer asked for the aid of the Scrum Masters but they weren't empowered to change anything about the giants. So they moved on and asked the product owners for help. Together they waited on the, until the giants were asleep, carried them into a forest, and with a big fence they made sure they were never able to bug the developers together again. Everything just worked perfectly well in this little software building kingdom, and everyone lived happily ever after, simply living by a simple set of rules. I call this a fairy tale for a reason. <laughs> um, I think most of you, can, can I have a show of hands who are, who are familiar with the Agile Manifesto? Right, basically a lot of you, <laughs> the biggest part of, uh, of it. Um, I love this, I really, really love this and I would really um, want this to work all the time, everywhere. But uh, as I 
uh, laid out in the little fairy tale I just told you, um, we don't live in a perfect world. Um, so sometimes you do have a fixed budget and a fixed scope, and sometimes they do want to have Prince do extensive reports. So I've got a, a, a bunch of tips to break the fairy tale down a bit. Um, this is my, my first tip. Know the stakeholders and culture and use an agile approach to keep it that way, actually. Know the customer village. Know who they are, know where they live, know what they love. Ask questions. Um, I'm blissfully living in, in Holland, and the Dutch are uh, known to be fairly blunt <laughs> and honest, and that helps a lot, actually. Uh, so the first question I always ask when at a kickoff with customers is, what problem are we solving for you building this application? And ask it all of the stakeholders. Ask all of them. Because there might be someone sabotaging. There might be someone who's not that keen of change. There might be someone who is very keen of change and really, uh, uh, and you will really help him or her to solve the problems they encounter. Um, also, to by asking these questions uh, uh, um, at your stakeholders, you can also figure out the culture of a company. A good question to ask uh, if, uh, to find out whether um, a company is, is agile or not, or has some agility, is how long did it take you to start this project? I have had customers uh, uh, who have been working for five years to start a new project. Uh, you know they won't be agile. Um, but. Uh, some some companies are like, oh yeah, well we, we just made a plan, and three months later we we ask you to build it, and then you're fairly sure that 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 this, the whole Scrum methodology will work. Um, knowing the stakeholders is a continuous project. You do have to uh, to to check them during every sprint. Uh, because stakeholders change, uh, not, e not, not only in person, but also they change their minds about the project and how it's going. So keep on checking on your stakeholders what their view is of your project, of what you're building. Um, make sure the team also understands the stakeholders and the client. What I usually do, I draw it on a board, I draw a couple of hat, uh, just hats, uh, some with curls, and I make I, I, I Keep track of, of how the stakeholders are feeling about the project by, by, by uh, uh, scribbling pluses or minuses on the board so everyone can visually see, uh, it's visualized how the stakeholders are feeling about your project. Um, and it changes through time, so keep on challenging that. Uh, also, I got some examples, for instance, uh, about culture, culture, cultural stuff. Um, I've been working for the uh, Ministry of Finance in the Netherlands, and uh, it took them two years to start a new project, and it was a typo three migration to Drupal. And one of the stakeholders was uh, the typo three content manager. <laughs> and I hear some, <laughs> you you know, um, for sure that uh, in this case she wasn't happy with this change because she loved typo. She was, but in typo three, it does. Um, make her, uh, what I did was making her the new queen of Drupal. So I called her every day. How is it going? Do you have some questions? Can I help you? Can I please, uh, um, uh, um, are there some, some things you miss about Drupal? Can, can we find a module for you to make it closer to typo three? So that actually turned out to, to work great because she became a, a Drupal ambassador within the company. And that's, that's a way to, to uh, keep on challenging your stakeholders and, and, and keeping them um, enthusiastic about the project. <coughs> the, the wrong thing we did there was uh, uh, fixed budget migration. Never do that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. Ever. <laughs> I have to look at what I tell because my boss is in the audience. <laughs> but this was at a former company. That helps. 
Um, another another um, uh, um, good example of what I encountered was uh, I thought I knew all the stakeholders. I thought I had them all, and I was fairly certain my backlog was okay, my sprint backlog was okay, and okay, we're going to build this. Uh, so we had the first sprint, we had the second sprint, we had the third sprint, and then I went to the demo, and uh, a colleague of mine, I always let the developers demo, of course, uh, and I type, uh, type out what, what happens in the demo. Uh, and then uh, uh, a woman came barging in 15 minutes late, 15 minutes late, all sweaty, and yeah, I'm sorry, I was in a meeting, and she sat down, and I said, okay, well, welcome. Um, who are you? Sprint three. I'm the project manager. I'm sorry, come again. <laughs> I'm the project manager. So I gave the demo, and uh, then afterwards she said, well, this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong. And I said, well, I'm sorry to be blunt, but I'm Dutch like that. Um, why are you arriving here at the end of sprint three? And she was like, well, I'm just project managing stuff. So, so other people are doing this for me, right? Yeah, but you, you weren't here for, for the last couple of months to, to make this project. So it's, it's, it's an example to stress out even more. Know your stakeholders. <laughs> it happens. Uh, I also have some, some, some good examples uh, about, about the culture part. Um, we uh, work for, uh, for a company um, that makes seeds, vegetable seeds. And no, it's not the big bad company from, uh, from America, but a tiny, uh, cute uh, Dutch one, uh, which uh, does uh, uh, biological, organic, and, and good stuff. <laughs> uh, they have uh, 15, 15 companies around the world, 15 uh, um, uh, organizations. And they are innovative in core. They uh, have been around for 100 years, um, just innovating seeds, make it better, making better uh, uh, cabbage, making better um, broccolis. Um, and they are very agile in, in, in the core uh, because they have machinery that is very blinky and new and just the, the, the latest of the latest technologies, but they also have an old sort of seed shaking thing uh, standing there in a the corner which is about 50 years old but it works so don't fix it because it works and they look at innovation like that we just okay where can we when they're so lean where can we uh, make things better where can we make small changes and and keep on plan do act check and and make this better so they understand how uh, agile work from the core from like 100 years ago um, that helps a lot when you're at the table building their new website because they understand that change doesn't come in a split second and that sometimes you fail at things and sometimes innovation you, you cannot innovate without failure and uh, so uh, I was there sitting down with a product owner um, we wanted to, to make a link with the product, uh, product database, and uh, we had thought out the whole plan how to do it and what, what was the best technical solution to do that. And later, as we found out, the third uh, company, uh, third-party software worked differently than we had assumed, and uh, the customer's IT department had assumed. So we were like, okay, now we have to start uh, over again or at least change this uh, this, this view of, on how to, to find a solution for this problem, so that, that'll take us time. Okay, so the project owner says, hmm, that's, that's too bad, because now I won't have uh, as much icing on the cake at the end at my website than I used to have, because my budget is getting smaller. And I was like, yes, you get it. <laughs> that's exactly how it works. We need more time here, so you won't have enough budget left over at the end of the project for new spiffy thingies. Uh, so there are companies who, who actually understand how this works. But um, it uh, takes a while. Uh, then a big problem is um, more than one PO is basically uh, what my subtitle of, the, of my presentation is how to hurt a flock of, of product owners. Um, in big companies, there never is one person 
the one product owner who knows all the business processes, who knows, uh, who has all the mandate about the budgets, who knows everything. Um, it's basically about a little bit like the giant fixed scope. I don't think they exist. That's fairly uh, uh, dangerous. Uh, standpoint, because a lot of people say there, it mu there must be a product owner. Uh, I don't think a, in, in a bigger company that they exist. Um, but maybe they, they do. Because when you work with a, with a product owner team, uh, we're building a website for a big city in the north of Holland, uh, and they have two product owners. Uh, which I actually kind of like in this case, because one product owner is from the ICT department, and one product owner is from the uh, customer side department, and they work together to, to make the backlog. Uh, so you have the business and the, the, the technical department combined together in a, in a PO team. Uh, so I said, okay, this will work out fine. Um, but at the first meeting, kickoff on, on how to just to make some appointments about uh, who's calling who, when, where, and uh, when is your day off, because product owners tend to work part-time somehow. Um, I was like, okay, so uh, you want a multilingual thing, thing right? Yes, said uh, the IST guy. Yes, we want a multilingual uh, thing, and uh, and uh, we want to have it in Drupal because Drupal's great at that, and uh, we wanted that. We would like to have that built in Drupal. Okay, so the the customer facing guy was like, oh no 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 no, we're not gonna do that because in our current website, which is the Drupal six site, we have a little tool uh, called LiveWords, and we can uh, uh, translate on the fly. So if someone go, goes to our website, clicks on the link uh, to, to go to the English part of the site, um, it will just translate on the fly through a third-party uh, component, and that works just perfectly fine for us. But it's expensive. So I had a problem there, because there were two product owners telling me something different. Um, and I was glad that it happened at an early stage, because at that point I could say, fine, so you both think someone else. Who's going to tell me who's right? And in came the project manager. Hi, I'm going to tell you who's right. Fine, then you're the product owner now. Because you're the one who's telling me what to do. So these guys are the stakeholders now, and you're the product owner. And he was like, oh, okay, because project managers are lazy by, 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 by standard. <laughs> so he was, hmm, I don't know if I like that role. No, but you just took it. So live with it. <laughs> Um, but I also uh, I worked uh, for for an NGO a while ago, and they had who well, basically not really a product owner. There were a lot of stakeholders, but uh, they were worrying about sick children and not about websites. And they knew a lot about sick children and and how to make them happy, and that, that's what they did all day. And yeah, of course we need a website because we need uh, sponsors and we need we need it, uh, but we don't know what we need, and they were completely. Um, blindfolded about who, who's going to be the product owner. We don't know. And I think at that point, uh, with customers like that, it's the best way to uh, find a product owner uh, uh, on the supplier side and put them in the, in the company. You must have trust for that. That's, that's because uh, the customer must trust you not to make um, choices based on uh, uh, the idea to make more money. Well, it's an NGO. You, you, you must be a real bastard to, to screw them over. But um, the, the, um, you have to have a lot of trust, but sometimes it's just the best way to have a product owner on the uh, uh, supplier side, I guess. Okay. Did I forget anything? Oh, yeah. I, I checked with, with a lot of my peers uh, before, I, uh, before I made this presentation. And one of the things I heard, and I think it's, it's a very good point, that a good product owner needs about a year to grow into his role. Um, problem is that projects are, are, are not that long <laughs> most of the time. But it, it's, it's good to know that it, that it takes a, a, a good year to, um, to become a good product owner. So maybe that is also... Uh, um, why it's a good idea to have them on the supplier side, because they got trained to do it. To do it. Okay. 
I'm gonna say uh, another dangerous thing now for the for the Scrum lovers uh, <laughs> under you. Um, Prints too can be all bad. It has been working for ages. Um, so you could try and embed some old systems things. I, I know there, there are a lot of uh, purists around who are like, no, what are you telling? Um, but I think it, it might be a good plan, especially to have, um, uh, for instance, I make sprint reports. That's so not scrum, that's so waste. But uh, sprint the sprint reports I make are, are about five pages, so it's not extensive reports. And it says, uh, uh, when the sprint was what we delivered, um, uh, if there are known defects, I know in Scrum there are no known defects, but in the real world there are the known defects, and also a report about the, uh, of the demo. Um, that's not really waste because I type the report while being in the demo. So uh, actually I have the report ready. Uh, the only thing that's missing is, is uh, hours, an hour report, and uh, the sprint demo report. So I type them when I'm at the demo. Uh, and it helps me a lot, actually, especially when you have large projects like 10 to 20 sprints to uh, look back at one of the sprint reports. I thought we talked about this earlier that you can that you can just go back to the reports and find, okay, we made the choice on that particular time a couple of months ago. Why did we do that? What was the discussion about? Um, so you have some um, some legacy you can you, you can fall back on just to, just to check why you made the choices you made. Um, so I think that's that's a good idea. Um, one thing that um, every large customer has is uh, change advisory board. And I know it's kind of princey, <laughs> but I think it's kind of needed to uh, uh, to to cope with the politics within a within a uh, organization. Because it helps, because people can have their say in, 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 in a sort of official way, because we're a change advisory board and we can say something about it. And uh, that, that helps to, to, to bring the scrum in, is my, my point of view. Uh, and uh, another great tip I got is um, when you have a risk log, visualize it. Um, I heard of, uh, of, uh, of a, uh, a colleague, of, a former colleague of mine, who had this risk log um, uh, plotted on a, on a radar. So they had a big radar screen on the, on the wall uh, with uh, impediments uh, pinned on them and, and other risk within the company. And um, when the impediments grew or, or, or got bigger or got pro more problematic, they moved it to the center of the, of the big radar. So everyone could see in just one overview, okay, these are the risks and this is how big they are. And I really like that. I think I'm going to, uh, to use that. So uh, free tip. Um, this also helps a lot, have an ambassador at the client. Um, also have that from, from, a, from a colleague of mine, um, which might not be the PO, by the way. But you want to have someone within the company who, ha uh, who's, who has lunches with the CEO at that uh, corporate level uh, uh, who explains Agile and the Agile way of working. You need an ambassador. If you don't have it, it's very, very hard to keep explaining it, and it takes a lot of effort to explain everything to, to, to the whole team within the company. And especially if the CEO is like, yeah, but here's my, my report and when is it ready and can you deliver me a planning and uh, because I have to allocate budget, it can be quite hard to bring the whole, the whole scrum thing in. Um, so have someone to talk to upper management and understands what, uh, and to make them understand what agility means. Okay. Uh, I think it's not only project management. I think it's change management. Because if you want a, a customer to be really agile and really work with you and really have the bonding and really have all the big issues within the agile manifesto, the whole company has to change. And this is a big thing. This is, this is not just, okay, we're building a website and we're doing it with Scrum. No, you have to, to change the whole mindset of a company. And that's hard. And that's 
um, maybe, sometimes even, I think some clients just won't change. And it's not a very happy ending <laughs> of this fairy tale. Um, but I think some, some companies we work for, um, uh, air traffic controllers in the Netherlands, they are so strict and, and, and so um, strict for a reason, of course. Uh, that is very hard to, 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 to bring in the whole scrum thing. And maybe then it's just uh, not the best way to go. And maybe you just have to let them be or say, okay, maybe we're not a company to build a website for you. Which brings me to the, I don't know if you know it, the manifesto for half assed agile software development. This is basically what happens if the, if the client won't move. Um, you can find it online. It's not, uh, not for me, but I'll just uh, take a sip of water. It really made me laugh, yeah. <laughs> My sheets will be online, so if you want to read it later, that's, uh, that's just fine. <laughs> Sometimes it just won't work. No. Okay. So, my recap. Know the stakeholders and the culture of your clients. No, no, know them and keep. This is not, this is an ongoing process. It's not standing still. You have to have an ongoing process to know your stakeholders, know your villagers. Uh, work with the PO team and then define the real one. That could be at the customer side or at the supplier side. Uh, embed old systems. At least that's what I do. Uh, have an ambassador at the client at the, the highest level in the organization. I think HL development isn't project management, it's change management. And some clients just won't change. Well, that was basically my talk. Uh, I'm going to do some... Uh, aftermath. Um, sprints are on Fridays. Please do so because we need it. All of you get Drupal 8 out of the door. <laughs> I'll do my part. Um, and this is a picture of uh, Drupal Camp Spain in uh, Jerez de la Frontera. Uh, I, I really, 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 really love the Spanish Drupal community. I'm standing over here. <laughs> in case you missed it. <laughs> and they asked me uh, if I could promote their next Drupal camp in 2016 in Granada. So I uh, especially wore the Granada t-shirts. If you want to know anything about Drupal Spain camps, I can tell you because I've been there. And please uh, go, go, go to Granada. Um, these are my contacts. Uh, I also do geocaching, so I'm hanging in the tree sometimes. Uh, so if you uh, want to reach out for me, you can use this contact information. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. And have a good call. <laughs> don't know if there are any questions. Yeah, or I'll repeat it for you. That's, that's fine, too. Hello. Do Hello. you have um, any tips or tricks for us? Um, you're there at the team of product owners. Mm -hmm. They all have their wants, I believe. Um, how do you make them um, change? Uh, how do you make them um, tell them what the business value is? So, how do you make them prioritize? That's the question. Okay. Well, you can do a couple of things. Uh, uh, once you, you have your backlog ready, uh, you can size them with your team, so give them story points. That's, that's, that doesn't say too much. Uh, what, what it says is how long will it take to build. And uh, then you can say, okay, uh, what's, um, can the website go live wi without this feature or not? And based on that, you score them. So you give them an extra score uh, between uh, uh, 100 and uh, 3,000 or something. And then you can just say, okay, so uh, uh, you really want your Twitter feed on your website? Please don't. But you really want your Twitter? Uh, can we go live without it? 
Yes, we can go live without it. Fine, I will give it 10 points. And when it takes uh, 50 story points to build and it's a 10 points business value, and I have another user story which says it, it takes uh, uh, 10 story points to build uh, and it has uh, 2,000 business value because it's the contact form, uh, then you can prioritize like that yeah. with the scoring. But how do you make them agree on the value? Um, or they don't. <laughs> um, the business because you you are making the business value. Yes. The idea is that they are so making the business value, one right? One feature has uh, mm -hmm. ten story points to build. The other one twenty. Mm -hmm. uh, the one product owner wants uh, really hard that one feature, but the nine others don't. So, what value will will you give it in your backlog? Do you give it um, 100 points? What I've heard is, is uh, what, you, what you can do is uh, let them pitch for their own uh, um, value. So you have nine, 10 product owners. Yeah. They do all do their pitch. I want this feature because yeah. I think this feature because my site needs a Twitter feed. Uh, after that, you, you will make a, a, a swarm thing. Let them pro uh, uh, put all the, the 10 uh, user stories on a board and let them swarm around, giving priorities on the, and it will level out itself. Okay. That's also a practice I used to use to, to when I have 10 product owners to prioritize. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, well, you can, you can, you can reach me anytime, so, oh, sorry. I thought you were leaving. I'm sorry, Ruben. Come on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, what, what do you do when you have uh, somebody that, that goes on sick leave or something happening? It's like how you do uh, change management or this kind of stuff. You use tools to document or? Um, that are two questions, right? Okay, let's start with the first one. <laughs> let's start with the first What do you do when uh, someone goes on sick leave? Well, actually, uh, uh, we're having that problem right now. Uh, one of our customers, that, uh, the, the main product owner, is, uh, is uh, on a long leave uh, at the moment. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit of an open door, but find a new one. <laughs> and you have to. And you have to make them. Otherwise, I'm sorry, but we really need someone who can tell us what to do. Otherwise, we... we, we have to stop the project right now. And mm -hmm. maybe you just have to say it like that. Okay, we're going to stop now and start later on. Um, in another project we're doing, we're also missing some, some information to, to start a new sprint. And we're like, okay, fine. Then we just won't start the sprint right now. Mm -hmm. And that basically helps to, to motivate people to find <laughs> someone else to do it. Because the deadline also uh, goes yeah, further close. away in time, of course. Yeah. Uh, and your second question was, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's how do you do the change management? So you use like tools for documenting when you just... No, I, 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 we use uh, as much as needed. And it depends on the client, how, how much, how excessive you, you document things. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the this, this, this seed supplier I was talking about there, okay, if you, if you just have a, uh, a three-page report about the things you, you, you've, been, you, you've walked through in a, in a conversation, but um, we also have uh, a customer who wants their sp uh, sprints uh, uh, officially, um, uh, um, how do you say it, accepted by all of the stakeholders, so they have a real big form with all names on it, and they all have to give their check boxes. It depends a lot of about it depends on the customer. Okay. How excessive you you yeah, it do that? Maybe sometimes they have their own tools, or sometimes you just suggest something they don't like it, and then you just change it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Congratulations okay. for the talk. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I, I have a question. It might be quite a silly question, and maybe a lot of you will be able to answer. So, silly questions you said, don't well, exist. you said that you can get, um, say, lots of product owners to do a swarm, and you know, let them fight for what's more valuable mm -hmm. and what should be done Bitch. first. Yeah, yeah basically, mm -hmm. do all the bidding. But 
I've noticed a lot of times what happens is that they do the bitching, then okay, someone agrees, okay, okay, fine, yeah, yeah, your stuff can go first, whatever. And the next <laughs> thing you do, what happens is that they will walk away off the meeting and then next day they'll come to you specifically and be like, yeah, no, I think my stuff needs to be done because of that. And, you know, n- none of other product owners are there whilst they're talking to you. Mm-hmm. How do you handle that? Because do you say, okay, go, let's go and have another meeting? Like, because that means I'm spending basically every time dragging them into a meeting to fight and still have to handle them all the time. Waste, waste, yeah. This uh, sounds a lot like uh, like the famous OC Layer 8 politics. Um, um, you have to you have to find the 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 the, the one product owner basically. I think mm-hmm. I'm not quite sure. I'm, I'm, I'm I've never been in this situation exactly. So yeah, it's more like in maybe there's someone else in the in the in the in the room that has a better answer than I do, but. Well, if anyone does, I'm just there, so <laughs> let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Because I'm up for a beer now. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Well, I kind of know that situation, so what happened? I'm going to lower it. I'm only yeah. 160. Um, um, and the problem was even worse. There were three or some some product owners, and they had all a different view. They agreed in the meeting, and afterwards they all separately went to a higher level mm-hmm. to escalate it. Mm-hmm. And then you had this higher level coming in. You couldn't make them product owner because they don't have time to be product owner. The only way is go to that higher level and say and ask who will be the product owner. And Just they es- have to escalate it yourself, basically. Yeah, okay. Going up and asking them who will have the last word and who will you believe. And the only thing you can do. You can't solve it on your level, you have to solve it on higher, I'm afraid. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Well, I'll be here for a couple of more days, so uh, if you uh, want to have a beer with me or, uh, or ask me any questions, uh, please feel free to. Uh, to address me. Thank you very much.